Welcome to Darien Library. Thanks so much for your patience. I think we all know how I-95 is this time of day. So, so we had an author come once and he called it uh, purgatory. So, <laughs> uh, My name's Erin. I'm the head of adult programming here at the library. And I would like to just take a moment to thank our friends of the library. Our annual campaign is what takes care of programs like these, and they make our collections available to the community. So thank you so much to the friends of the library. <laughs> Tonight's guest is a novelist, screenwriter, and television producer. He adapted his debut novel, The 25th Hour, into a feature film directed by Spike Lee and starring Ed Edward Norton. After that, he came out with a collection of short stories titled When the Nines Roll Over, the Publishers Weekly called a superb collection. He then went on to write the screenplay for Troy and later the screenplay for Stay, which starred Ewan McGregor and Naomi Watts. Did anyone see the movie The Kite Runner? Yeah. He wrote the, or he adapted the screenplay for that as well. And did anyone see X-Men's Origins of Wolverine? <laughs> he did that one too. In 2008, his second novel, City of Thieves, was published. Now I'd like to know how many people in this room either read or are currently reading City of Thieves. Excellent. This book tells the story of Lev and Kolya, two young men who are sent on a suicide mission to retrieve a dozen eggs during the siege of Leningrad. It was, as most of you know, Darian's one book, one community choice for this year. And I've heard absolutely nothing but positive comments from patrons, except one person, she really enjoyed the story, but she did say there was a little too much potty language. <laughs> Now, when I write introductions for our authors, I always do a lot of research into the history of their writing and their career. And while I was doing this for tonight's guest, I came across an old reading guide from Penguin's website, which was from 2008 when the novel came out. And it included an author interview. The very last question in the author interview was, what are you working on now? And our guest answered, it's a series for HBO, We'll see if it ever gets made. So <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys have heard of this little series on HBO. It's called Game of Thrones. Uh, but he is a writer for Game of Thrones as well. Please join me in welcoming to Darian Library, Mr. David Bennett. Thank you. wasn't the 95, I got sequestered. I was, uh, <laughs> I was in Syracuse for a reading last night and had a um, 12.30 flight out this afternoon and I kind of pushed 1.30 and then 2.30 and then 3.30 and finally 4.30. Uh, so thank you all for waiting. I'm, I'm so sorry I'm late and thank you for waiting. Okay, so the first question I have for you is something that a lot of our community members were I don't want to say confused about. Well, I'll say confused about. We assumed that the story was oh, based <laughs> on your grandfather. <laughs> but was it based on your grandfather and your grandmother? No. My, my grandfather, uh, whose name is Shim Benioff, was born on a farm in Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> and grew, up, grew up to be a furrier in Allentown, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and married my grandmother, Florence Benioff, who uh, was Probably the farthest thing imaginable from a sniper. Uh, <laughs> was, and and uh, she did make the best crab soup in the world. Though. And uh, they, they were married and lived happily together for, for many years in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And as far as I know, never went to Russia. <laughs> well, it is a novel, so. <laughs> so don't put me on Oprah. <laughs> Throughout the reading series that we had here, we actually had a little question box on our welcome desk where people could put in questions as they read the book and came up with them. And one of the questions that was in the box was, why did you choose this time period to explore this young male friendship? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is I had this idea for a story, um, uh, just a two young men looking for a dozen eggs in a city under siege. And, and that idea came without anything else with it. it didn't, there wasn't a specific time period, it was just this kind of strange idea. And I remember where I was, um, 
uh, I remember kind of where I was walking when I had this idea, but that was it. And it, it seemed very vague and and, uh, and maybe a little stupid. But but um, but then I was trying to figure out where to set it and was researching various cities under siege. So uh, was first looking at Sarajevo and, and uh, was looking into some medieval cities and eventually read this book um, by Harrison Salisbury called The Nine Hundred Days, which is um, you know this magisterial account of the siege of Leningrad written by a New York Times journalist who was the first Western reporter to get access to the city uh, after the siege was lifted. And, and it's just such a breathtaking book. And I was probably halfway through that book and I realized this is the city and this is the time I want to write about. Great. So we also hosted a book discussion with the City of Thieves during this series. And one of the questions that came up is there were some mothers in the discussion and they couldn't believe that Lev's mother would have let, let him stay in Leningrad when she left with his sibling. Right. Was that a difficult decision for you to decide to write that? No. <laughs> much of a story if she had taken. <laughs> but the truth is, even though he sounds young by our standards, uh, at that time, kids of his age were, were serving in the Red Army. So, you know, he wasn't really considered a, a child by the standards of that, of that time and that period. Um, and, you know, I tried to do as much research as I could in, into what actually happened and, um, you know, whether it's, it's uh, uh, accounts like Salisbury's, but also first-person accounts. And one of the best resources turned out to be diaries of people who were there during the siege. And and, um, and, and so there were numerous accounts. I mean, for, for example, the first scene with the, um, the fire brigade, you know, the kids who would, their job was to, uh, these incendiary bombs were dropped by the Germans, their job was to put them out before it could burn down too much of the city. And, and, uh, and these were kids. I mean, it was kids who were in these uh, brigades, and um, by and large, these were kids whose parents were no longer there, whether because they had died or because they were gone, they had left earlier. Um, and, you know, one, one of the things, aside from just the factual stuff that was fascinating in the diaries, was the tone of these diaries, because you'd expect kind of more, uh, you'd expect it to be grimmer, and, and, but there was this wonderful dark humor, gallows humor, that comes through, and even in the, in the darkest of times, and this was an excruciatingly dark time, um, a 900 day siege where more than half of the city was, was killed either by German shelling or bombing or starvation for the most part. Despite all of that, they retained the sense of humor and they retained this intense will, not just to survive, but just survive as human beings um, and to, to retain their culture. You know, people kept attending concerts, they kept attending theater performances, uh, in, in the winter of 1942, they printed 100,000 copies of War and Peace with incredibly cheap uh, paper, and and within you know days, those 100,000 copies had been scooped up, and it was almost as if the, the the city was having this kind of massive book club. Everyone was reading War and Peace, which was so relevant not only because it's you know the great Russian novel, but also because it's about another invasion and another force of invaders coming in and trying to conquer their land. So. Um, the diaries were, were great inspiration and have gone far afield from your original questions. That's okay. <laughs> That's how interviews are supposed okay. to go. Okay. <laughs> My next question for you is, there's a scene toward the end that's a very detailed chess battle. So while I was reading it, I was like, he must have some background in chess. How did you write that scene? Or at least have enough knowledge about chess to write that scene? <laughs> um, I, I play chess, but I'm a, I'm a bad chess player. And, and, um, but my father uh, was an obsessive chess player for many years and, and collected chess books. And so I was around chess a lot. And even though I don't have any particular talent for it, I always found it interesting. And more just the kind of the notion of the game than the game itself. Man, I do like playing, but I hate losing at it. Because <laughs> if you lose at a tennis match or something, you're just you're not as good at tennis as the other person. But if you lose at chess, you just feel like they're smarter than you. So, so, <laughs> so I, I kind of stopped after getting crushed by too many of my friends. But but I had all these chess books um, around when I was a kid, and I would read about the various grandmasters, and and uh, and I think that's you know so that helped inform the actual game that was played. This next question was from our box on the welcome desk, and it was. What was the more important goal for Lev, sex or food? 
<laughs> um, uh, you know, I would have to say food because if if you if you starve, then they're. Yeah, I think I think food had to come first. <laughs> I think food came first. Food and and uh, and you know some means of staying uh, staying keeping yourself from freezing to death. Um, so e even as an adolescent and. It, I always get a little bit defensive when people say, um, I read the book and I really loved Kolya because, you know, Lev is the one who I feel, I was the, you know, I was the teenager with, um, when I was 14, I was 94 pounds and had the same nose, so <laughs> I, I was a virgin until far too late in life and, and uh, incredibly awkward around girls and, and all of that. So everything basically to Lev is except for the fact that I grew up in wildly different circumstances, but and so I identify with that kind of awkward love of it all, and um, uh, and Kolya is alien to me. I mean, Kolya is a lot of fun to write about because he's so different, but was completely alien. So uh, anyway, getting back to the question, even though I think sex is probably something that Lev thought about almost all the time, I think uh, he needed to eat something first. <laughs> the next question is, how did you choose the title, City of Thieves? Yeah. Um, um, the title did not come easily, and I still don't know if it's the right title. I, I had a different title, a different working title. I don't even remember now. It wasn't very good. <laughs> and my, my editor um, at Viking, Molly Stern, said, um, well, we obviously need to find a different title. <laughs> and and, uh, and this, is, this is kind of an ongoing theme for me. With, with 25th Hour, I, I didn't have a title. I had another bad working title, and the editor said, I'm going to publish this book. Um, as long as you agree to change the title. And I said, fine, because my working title wasn't good, and, and then spent the next six months trying to come up with a better title, all of which were rejected, and, and rightfully so, I think. And eventually it was the editor who came up with the 25th hour, which, which I ended up loving, but, you know, had nothing to do with it. Um, so with Molly, I was just, I was trying to come up with titles, and she was trying to come up with some, and she would send me emails with just terrible, you know, a dozen eggs, so it just, <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of options with eggs in the title, and just everything with eggs sounded kind of silly to me. And then I, and then I, um, as I was reading um, this, uh, one of the old communist newspapers it was called Truth for Young Pioneers. It was, um, and I thought Truth for Young Pioneers, that's, that's a good title. And I was going with that for a while, and then was speaking to a friend, and he said, "What's your new book called?" And I said, "Truth for Young Pioneers." And he just gave me this look that was so dismissive. <laughs> Oh, that's a good title. It's a smart title. He said, "That's the most pretentious." Title. <laughs> no one's going to pick up a book called "Truth for Young Pioneers." <laughs> and even though I argued with them and said you're wrong, um, it sort of stuck in my head. And a couple days later, uh, I, I, I decided "City of Thieves" would be catchier. And and then, um, but it, it didn't really make any sense because it didn't. It didn't there, there was nothing in the book that said to be a thief, so then I made up this um, Hitler line to make it to make it make sense. Where you know Hitler had said all these terrible things about Leningrad, um, and he had actually planned to have this this victory party after they had conquered Leningrad, and they, in fact, I think this is mentioned in the book, they had printed out invitations to the victory party that was going to be held once they conquered Leningrad, and um, um, which they never got to celebrate, and. Uh, and so he, but he had said all these things because, you know, in his mind it was the birthplace of Bolshevism and all these other sins. And, and so I just added the, the phrase City of Thieves in his list, his litany of complaints about Leningrad. And my editor still never liked it. I just had dinner with her a couple of nights ago and she was still complaining about the title. <laughs> 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 so, what is the biggest difference between writing a novel and writing for the screen? Um, you know, with the novel, everything that it, it's all on you. It, the, the, the novel succeeds or fails based on your own merits as a writer, and everything um, that the reader gleans from that novel is is you have to put down on the page. So, the easiest, um, I guess, analogy would be if, if you're talking about a, a library room in a, in a novel, I would have to describe everything. I'd have to write, you know what the people look like, what the room looks like. It all has to be there or else the reader's not able to envision that. With a screenplay, you write interior, library room, evening, and then go, and you're, you're yeah. set. And you, you maybe say the number of, of extras here. No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
uh, and, and a, a very talented production designer and her team of, of artists will will figure out what the room looks like, and and uh, the you know the casting department will bring in the, the extras or background talent, as they're called now. Uh, uh, so so it's just it's easier. Screenplays are much easier. They're much quicker. You look at a screenplay. There's so much white space on a page, and that white space is really comforting because you don't have to fill it. You know, a novel. Every single page of a novel is just dense with black, you know, all that black type, and, and you've got to come up with all that black type. So, so the novel is, is much more intensive. As a, in terms of writing process, it's much longer, much harder, it's much more grueling. I mean, every sentence is a, is a battle because you're, you're trying um, to the best of your ability to make every sentence good. You know, the screenplay, not all sentences have to be good, because most of them are really there for the crew to figure out what they need to do to make the scene right. You know, the dialogue is the thing that's going to show up on screen or, or show up, you know, coming out of your speakers. But, um, so anyway, so uh, novels are much harder, much, much more labor intensive, and, and ultimately I think more fulfilling because it, it's all yours. You know, the, the story that you're trying to tell is being transmitted directly from the writer to the reader, as opposed to writing a screenplay where you've got a director interpreting it first, you've got actors interpreting it, and everything else. I, I, I love the, that collaboration, that having great, great time working on Game of Thrones, but um, but just in terms of the pure act of writing, I don't think anything tops with fiction. Mm -hmm. So my last question is, would you be willing to take some questions from the audience? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very <laughs> Screenplay, since you can't really get into the interior thoughts of the characters, isn't it that make it tougher? Yeah, well, it, it's a really good question. I mean, some some screenwriters try to do that by using voiceover, and and uh, I I guess don't like voiceover. I I, I don't want to be too um, universal about it because there are some great movies that employ voiceover and, and use it really skillfully, and some of the French New Wave movies do it beautifully, and, and a lot of others you can think of. But in general, if I'm watching a movie or reading a script and it starts out with a lot of voiceover, a character telling you what he or she thinks, it just feels like a crutch to me. Um, so the trick really is to figure out how to convey the, the character's thoughts, um, either through dialogue or, or through action. And, and um, it's especially tricky if the, the character is not going to say something. You know, we usually don't say, if we're in an intense situation, we often don't say exactly what we're thinking. So, um, so that's, that's the trick of it. And it's especially tricky with an adaptation, uh, something like The Kite Runner or, or uh, you know, any adaptation where so much of the book takes place in the character's mind and you're trying to figure out how to convey that on screen um, without resorting to the various crutches of, uh, you know, whether it's voiceover or large chunks of text on the screen. Of the <laughs> uh, so it's a real challenge. It's also what's kind of a relief to get back to writing fiction when you can actually go back into a character's mind and not have to, not have to worry so much about how to convey it all through surfaces. Thank you. Yes, sir. One comment and one question. Okay. I love the title, City of Thieves. Thank you. I saw such a connection with so much of the action that was either actual that you could see or what was going on in the characters' minds. I thought it was a perfect fit. That's good to hear. Thank you very much. I can tell Molly that. <laughs> and my question is, with the research that you did and the journals and diaries that you accessed, where did you find them? Were they, did you go to Russia? Were yeah. they in archives here? A little bit of both, yeah. I, 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 um, there, there's a lot available in the library. I mean, now things are probably easier with the internet, but I was, um, when I started researching it, I was still kind of uh, dumb about the internet. So, so libraries were a great resource. And then actually going to St. Petersburg and mm -hmm. uh, um, meeting some people. I had a, um, a young guy who was kind of my guide to the city, and, and, but I also tasked him with finding me some, some people who had, who had been there and lived through it. And then he would work as my translator. and. Uh, and there's still people, um, uh, you know, there are, there are people in Brooklyn who uh, who survived the siege, you know, who I, who I found uh, 
<laughs> you were a rabbi. <laughs> yes. So, so my rabbi, the man who bar mitzvah, me ended up being a really important resource. And it's a really book. I'd be glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah, he would. And, and it's incredible. And again, I mean, just as in with the diaries, where you know the sense of humor really comes through. Talking to some of the survivors, and one guy in particular who really um, stayed in my mind because he was this tiny little <coughs> man, and probably an inch, maybe five foot one. And uh, and 110 pounds, and, and you know, must have been about uh, I don't know, must have been about 90 when I was talking to him. And but just just tough, you know, just for this like a piece of leather. And and but he would tell these stories, and some of them were so grim, um, you know, stories about yeah. And then when the grandmother died, we had when grandma died, we had to haul her out to the pile of bodies out there. And and you're listening and talking about dragging his dead frozen grandmother out of the apartment and somehow he ends it with a joke and then he's like, like ah <laughs> and I'm kind of scribbling down notes thinking wow that's a horrible story <laughs> so it, it, was, it was wonderful to talk to real people who have been there looking up aside from just the books yes sir in the back uh, there's someone on the option for a uh, film and if you had to pick three writers influence the book or still are influencing you now <coughs> you're reading at night or on a plane, who would they be? Um, as for the option, are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> if I had the money? <laughs> um, no, I haven't given this one up because um, because I've worked on uh, I feel like I got lucky with 25th Hour. I actually really liked the movie that came out of it, but that oftentimes that's not true for writers. I certainly know a lot of writers who are unhappy with the way their books were adapted. And, and the truth is, in Hollywood, once you sell your book, you lose all control over it. And and uh, and so I have, you know, shortly after the book came out, I had a meeting with a director who wanted to do it, and a very nice man who spoke very uh, intelligently about the book. And then he started talking about how he'd want to cast it. And I. I all of his idea, all of his casting ideas were so, I don't want to say they were so horrible, maybe they were great at it, but they were so um, uh, so contrasted with the way I saw the movie working that right then I decided I'm not, I'm not going to do it. So um, I think if, if I ever felt that I could do it myself, then maybe I would do it, um, but I'm not going to give it up to someone else. And, and, you know, maybe Steven Spielberg. If, if, <laughs> Almost anyone. Uh, and then as, as for the three writers, uh, you know, I, I, I started out thinking I was going to be an academic, I was going to be a professor, and I, I went to Ireland to get my master's, and I wrote my master's thesis on Samuel Beckett. Uh, so Beckett is probably the most important writer for me, but I don't think he's an influential writer in, in that, uh, or he's influential, but I've never tried to write like Beckett. I don't think there's anything I've ever written that's remotely, mostly because I think you, you'd have to be a, a a raving idiot to try to write like Beckett. Um, but he's the one who I've studied the most. Uh, uh, Hemingway and, um, and Chekhov short stories, probably. Maybe my other two. Yes, sir. Uh, I, something I'm wondering, as somebody who obviously has been the, the source of creative material in your own novels and screenplays, if you could talk about the challenge of having to adapt someone else's work. Yeah, it's easier when they're dead. <laughs> That said, I, I, I became um, uh, I became friends with Talad Hosseini after after working on Kite Runner, and, and which was just not always the case. And I've had some, you know, there are some experiences that are they're obviously like anything else, they're they're good experiences and bad ones. The one with Talad was was fantastic uh, uh, because he's first of all he's just a, he's a true gentleman um, and kind of like a throwback, just a very elegant man and, and uh, incredibly charming and, and sweet and. He, I, I needed him as a resource when I was writing that screenplay because I, I grew up in New York and I'm Jewish. I didn't know anything about growing up, you know, Muslim in Kabul, and 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 we didn't want to make mistakes. You know, when we're making that movie, there's there's so many possible mistakes you can make. And I'm sure we made some, but at least on the, in terms of things that, that um, he could help me with, um, you know, what was it like in the 1970s if you're going to if you were a kid going to the mosque? What was the um, you know what? What did you do right before you went in? Just, just very basic stuff. Some of which didn't even make it into the movie. But um, so there were constant late night emails from me to him, and he was always, you know, um, such a, a professional about answering them and explaining why things would be this way. So, so that was great. Sometimes it can be a tense 
uh, experience. There's a Steve Martin line, which I'm going to butcher. I'm not going to try to, to, to repeat it, but he says something about how an adaptation, adaptation starts out as this very romantic affair where both both people are in love, you know, because for writers it's an exciting thing to get your, your book adapted and, and uh, it means a lot of money and it's just there's there's a certain romance to it, but at a certain point the romance sours and it ends up in, in this kind of awful divorce and, and I've certainly, I think I've been lucky in that the, um, the writers I've adapted uh, you know, Haled was, was wonderful, and George Martin now, just uh, the Game of Thrones writer, he's a man who came from Hollywood. He worked in Hollywood for 10 years. He worked on uh, a show called Beauty and the Beast. He worked on uh, the, the new incarnation of the Twilight Zone. So he kind of knew how the sausage was made and was very, um, was always very professional with us, knowing that there would be certain changes with adaptation. But uh, am I answering your question? Or am I no, you are. Okay. <laughs> it's the right analogy with the sausage, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's what we have. <laughs> yes, sir. Why do you think the Russians have produced so many world-class novelists? What is there about their character or discipline that's allowed them to do that? Well, I think, I think one thing is they really cherish their writers. You know, you go over there and you get into these in-depth conversations. With, I, was, I, I was embarrassed almost when I went to, um, I was in Kiev, and I went over there to write an article for, for a magazine. And I was um, the article. This is, the, art, the article was about Russian American men who go over there looking for Russian brides. So, um, and I used the, that as an excuse to get to Russia uh, all these years ago to help research the book. Anyway, while I was there, I was talking to some of these people who worked for this Russian bride company. Um, many of them were young women, and they were, uh, you know, in one in particular, I remember who was probably 22, and I said something about. Uh, um, Pushkin, and she started quoting uh, Dean Onegin, and just quoted the whole first, I don't know how long, she, until I told her to stop. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the passion for literature there is is, um, is, is incredibly impressive and, and a little bit depressing then when you come back here. I find the same in Ireland. I mean, I spend a lot of time in Ireland because that's where we, we make the show, so I, I live there half the year. In Ireland, you know, the, the pound notes have James Joyce on them. And it's hard to imagine a you know, dollar bill with, with uh, Faulkner on it. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, in both countries have produced, Ireland certainly, um, considering how small a country it is, has produced a, a, a crazily out of proportion number of wonderful poets and writers. And, you know, Russia is, is um, uh, it's especially look at the 19th century. I mean, they were just, they were just uh, in a different league from almost everyone else. And I think a lot of it comes, comes back to that, I mean, a real, uh, respect for the writer's craft and and, uh, and the fact that they cherish the writer, their historical writer, so right now. So, so I'm going to ask you a question. Um, obviously, the siege of Lenin was horrible. I found the book wonderful, but filled with humor. How could you reconcile the siege of Lenin Grant with this book that was really filled? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And again, I was, I was, uh, in, in that regard, was really inspired by the survivors, you know, both the diaries and, and the people I spoke to, um, and, and the complete lack of self pity you found from the survivors, and I found that inspiring, and also felt like, you know, there there are a lot of really rough passages in this book, and, and brutal things happen, and um, if you are good at certain parts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you bring in, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful book. And well, it's just that, you know, for me, and it's, it's, it all comes down to personal preferences, but I have a hard time. If something is, is just a grim slog from page one to, to the end, uh, I have a hard time with that. And, and I knew this was going to be a book. I knew there were going to be many hard uh, parts in this, but there are going to be pages that you don't want to get through, and there are going to be things that, that uh, are, are just, you know, it's, it's a, you don't want the whole book to be a catalog of atrocities, I guess, despite the fact that so many atrocities were committed here. And um, and also just felt that these are the characters I want to write about, and, and they're funny, you know? I mean, I think I think Kolya is, is really funny, and that's kind of what I loved about him, what I loved about writing about him. And I think I would have had a hard time, um, you know, writing about characters who, who weren't funny. And, and I just really admire that ability, the, the ability to, um, you know, the Yates line, cast a cold eye on death, uh, 
just that that is something I admire is that that bravery and the ability to keep laughing even when um, things look so terrible. So it was a really important thing for me to try to bring some humor in there. We have time for two more questions. Yes, sir. How would you feel about somebody trying to adapt the courtyard hound into a movie? <laughs> <laughs> I see a lot of sources. Um, yeah. That's funny. There's there's a band now called the Courtyard Hounds. I saw it. The Dixie Chicks. <laughs> the Dixie Chicks. Yeah, exactly. Um, gosh, I don't know if there's enough story in there to make that. Oh, there's funny. I've thought about it really? many times. <laughs> um, well, really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'd be I'd be curious to hear that pitch. Um, uh, seems like it would be a tricky one, but. I'm trying to even remember what happens in the court. Is there more folks who they yeah. keep attempting to draw out right. over time? And I felt like right. the people that kept coming in to try to draw them out would have plenty of stories of their own right. to bring the screen. That's going to be a tough movie. <laughs> so I'll attempt it. Okay. <laughs> okay well, I want to see it. I want to see it. Um, we only have time for two. Uh, God, this, is, this is painful. Can we do a few more? <laughs> yes, sir. Hi. Uh, it seems that over the last 15 or years or so that uh, political thriller movies are successful almost in inverse proportion to their dealing with anything serious that, mm -hmm. that touches us. And you've gone from human drama to a very strong political social set and strong political background to fantasy. If you will. You have any insight on how to thread that, how a writer can, film writer can thread that you to do something that is commercially acceptable that people will buy tickets for, but still has any kind of social element involved in it? Well, I think it's increasingly hard because the studios are, are, are less and less interested in making movies for, for grown-ups. I mean, honestly, and, and, and there are always exceptions. And, and last year, actually, there were a few, you know, high-quality exceptions. But the truth is, if you look at the movies that make a ton of money, um, they're not sophisticated in any shape or form. I mean, they're, they're going to be about, uh, you know, it's, they're going to be about vampires or aliens or alien vampires or so. Um, <laughs> And, and and it's a it's such a long shot for a studio to make a, a movie that's that's aimed for an adult audience uh, and a sophisticated adult audience that I think they've they've largely given up unless there's some star whether it's Ben Affleck or or George Clooney or someone who can force it through you know through the strength of their own star power. Um, so you know in, in a lot of ways what we've seen is a migration of writers who are who are interested in doing something a little bit different from that. To television, where they have more opportunities and and, uh, and more freedom, you know, there's just much less control. Uh, not not control. There's, there's much less kind of uh, censorship, especially on cable. Um, so to get back to your question, I think I think it's, it's really hard with the studio movie. I think the, the better chance is with independent movies, and sadly there are fewer and fewer independent movies these days. Um, so really, what you need is is uh, a star. I mean, if you're talking about writing a, a sophisticated political thriller. And um, and you want to get it made, and you want to get butts in the seats. You need you know you need George Clooney, or you need Brad Pitt, or you need one of those guys because the movie's just not going to get made with with um, with no names. They'll they'll make a no name movie that's a high concept you know science fiction thing. They're not going to make a political thriller that stars you know um, Johnny No Name. So uh, that would be my advice: is trying to get one of those guys. You know and and, and that means trying to write a script that's going to appeal to an actor who's, um, you know, who's, who's got taste, hopefully. And uh, I don't know if that's at all useful to you, but but you know, it's it's um, there are people are looking for good material. You know, they're still looking for good material. It's just it's not the studios looking for it so much anymore. So it's trying to find an alternate route to get that material into the right hands. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, with the power of life and death over your characters, how do you decide who is going to live at the end? And who um, you know, I always knew what the ending of, of I always know what the ending of, of anything I write is going to be before I started, um, because that's the only way I can work. I, I need to know where it's going. Otherwise, 
it didn't used to be that way, and I would just get lost. And before I wrote uh, Twenty Fifth Hour, I wrote two novels that were that were never published, rightfully never published. And, and the first one I didn't even submit because it was really quite bad. The second one was rejected by thirty-four publishers, <laughs> which is all of the publishers, really. <laughs> um, and I, I got. Uh, and I had just moved to LA, and the rejection letters were sent to the place I'd lived in New York, and so they were all collected and put in one brown mail. <laughs> so I ended up getting 34 rejection letters in one day and, uh, for a novel that I'd spent four and a half years working on. And, and it, was, it was a bad day. Um, about a week later, I went back and, and read the letters again, and most of them were just kind of form rejections. Uh, uh, but a few of them, the editors actually took the time to write something, which, which I deeply appreciate. And, um, and and there was a kind of a theme to what they said, which was, um, we like your writing, we like the characters and the dialogue, but the story just doesn't hold together. It's all over the map. And then I remembered that when I was um, assembling this book that took me four and a half years to write, I had 34 chapters, and it was um, various different timelines, and, and, and I had put the first page of each of the 34 chapters on the floor, and was trying to arrange it in such a way so it made sense to me. And many years later, you know, after I got these rejection letters, I realized maybe arranging first pages of chapters on the floor in the mosaic isn't the right way to structure your book. Maybe you should have a sense of the structure before that. And so then I decided I need to know where the story is going. So when I started City of Thieves, I knew exactly who was going to live and die way before um, I got there. And um, I, I feel like I always know the beginning and I always know the ending, and it's the, the middle that surprises me. Um, and I didn't want to write certain scenes. I didn't want to write, you know, it's, it's, you become much more attached to characters after you've spent a few years writing about them because they spend so much time in your mind, and it becomes really difficult to do those terrible things to them. But, uh, but um, it had to happen. <laughs> yes, sir. I have two questions for you. Um, the first is about the circumstances of the 25th hour, and like, how did you get from, I guess, the, the novelist phase to writing a screenplay? Were you approached by a director, or did you like take that initiative to go to the film in industry yourself? And then the second question, just about the research and the writing process. Obviously, like some some things you probably found were like plot points, like going and seeing the dogs blowing up and. Uh, the cannibals, but like, how did you, I guess, balance those like larger points versus like the very nitty gritty, like, I guess, like details that go in each sentence? Um, right. Uh, like, well, how does that go into the writing process? Do you write a draft first or something? Um, I don't write a rough draft first. I write an outline first. Yeah. And there are certain points that I want to get to. There are certain beats that I want to hit at some point in the story. So the, the dogs, the exploding dogs, totally true story. And that was something I, I learned in the research. The, um, the cannibal that, that happened, people were selling human meat in the black market. Um, all true. And it was just trying to figure out, you know, uh, where are the characters going to encounter these things? And, and you know, that's, that's what I was saying about figuring out the middle. Because you know that at some point, I knew that I wanted to have a scene with the cannibal. I knew I wanted to have a scene with the exploding dogs. I didn't know where it was going to come. And part of it is, um, you know, as much as I like to, I, I like to know the beginning and the end. I don't like to be too regimented with an outline because it sort of then it constrains you and it feels, you know, I love reading a book where I feel that the author has confidence. The author is taking you on a journey, and, and he or she knows exactly where taking you and and you feel that authorial confidence because it just it makes you feel like you're in good hands um, but I also like to be surprised you know and I think sometimes that surprise comes when when you're, you're writing about the characters and they can do things that you weren't expecting them to do and I don't mean in a kind of mystical way it's just it's just you, you're writing them and, and all of a sudden the character says something your fingers typed it you weren't really expecting it and you know you write enough lines, and and, uh, and all of a sudden you're at the exploding ducks. I don't know. Sometimes it just kind of happens. <laughs> like that. Um, what was the first question? Oh, the first question was 25th hour. It was optioned by Toby McGuire, and and he wanted to play the lead. And I met with him in Los Angeles, and it was a good meeting. And he said, Well, why don't you write the script? And I said, uh, Okay, I'm not in the writers guild or anything. He said, Well, great. Then you're cheap. <laughs> and that was true. That was true. And. and uh, so really, that's the only reason I got that job. I think is because he's the one who optioned it, and we happened to have this this meeting, and, and it was it was very lucky. Um, 
looking back on it, it was absurdly lucky. And then he ended up getting the offer of Spider-Man and made a very smart career move of taking Spider-Man instead of Monty Bergen and, and, uh, and still stayed on as a producer. But anyway, so that's how I got there. Someone in the back. Yes. Time for one more. I <laughs> 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 can ask questions during the signing. Very uh, I heard rumors that George R. R. Martin for uh, Game of Thrones is very strict about the way he wants to show. What was it like working with him? Adapting. You heard rumors that he's very, that he's very what? Strict about how he wants the show to go. What was it like working with him, working on the Song of Ice and Fire series? Uh, I wouldn't say that he's very strict about them. I think he's got there. There are certain things that um, that drive him nuts. He, he, he you know, George is a real student of medieval warfare, so it makes it absolutely crazy <laughs> when these knights go into battle and they're not wearing their helmets. <laughs> <laughs> Stupidest thing of, you're not wearing steel all over your body and you your head on the thing. And he's and he's right. But at the same time, you have a scene, um, I'll say to you because you obviously watched the show, where you have the hound uh, in, in the Blackwater episode and he's and you have to see him being terrified of a man on fire coming at him. And you're not gonna see that fear if he's wearing his giant hound helmet. So there are times when we have to, you know, say, George, we get it, and, and you're right on a on a factual level, but there's also a dramatic level, and you know, we're gonna we're gonna make certain allowances for that. Um, he's 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 not strict. Though. I mean, he's uh, we've made a number of changes, and, and by and large, he's been uh, he's been I'd say incredibly happy with the way the series has turned out. Um, and as I said, you know, he's someone who comes from the business, so he understands that there are gonna be changes. Something we told him at the very beginning was. We love these books. The only reason we're going to dedicate years of our lives to, to making the series is because we love these books. Um, but there are going to be forks in the road, you know, and 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 that fork is there's the left turn is going to mean retaining absolute faith to the books, and the right turn means doing what we think is best for the series, even if it's not absolute faith to the books. And whenever we're confronted with that choice, we're going to go right every time, every time. And and we shouldn't do this together if if you're not okay with that. And he said, I'm okay with that, let's make a show. And, uh, and that's what we've done. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not to say that there aren't certain things that I wish, that they, I'm sure he wishes were different, but I think overall he's been very happy with, with how it's turned out.